Hello, one and all, to this KSP commentary video. Now if you would prefer to watch this video without my voice and would rather have it shorter with music and stuff, then there is a link down in the description as well as in the last 20 seconds of this video to take you to such a video. As you may be aware, I'm part of YouTube's uh, air quotes end card program, which means that I can have cool end screens with on-screen annotations that mobile users can use, but unfortunately it means that I can't have annotations anywhere other than in the last 20 seconds of the video. But I hope it's not too inconvenient for you to use the link in the description instead, or to simply watch this video first. So, introductions and formalities out of the way, this is a fairly well requested video of me constructing a monolithic space station around Joule, which is the Kerbal analogue for Jupiter for those of you unfamiliar with the Kerbin system. It's a fantastic place to visit, not only because it's visually stunning and it's unique in that it's the only gas giant in the game, it's also because of the fact it has five moons orbiting it. Uh, there's Pol and Bop, which are tiny and very easy to land on, uh, there's also Val, which is similar to the Moon in terms of its gravity and it's similar to Minmus in terms of its appearance. Then you got Lathe, which is an ocean-covered moon and the long-lost cousin of Kerbin itself and my personal favourite dual moon. And then we have Tylo, which is the single hardest celestial body to land on in the game if we're not including Jewel and the Sun, as it has virtually the same gravity as Kerbin, but no atmosphere for parachutes or air brakes to be used in. Anyway, back to talking about this craft. When I say it's a monolithic space station, uh, a monolithic space station is one that is constructed on the ground and then launched into space in one piece, which is how all the early Earth space stations were designed. So, you know, you've got your Salyut stations, Almaz stations, and of course, Skylab. However, to call this station monolithic would be somewhat misleading as, while all its components are being sent up in one launch, it is not even in its final form yet. <laughs> so you can guess, I guess you can consider this more of a flat pack station rather than a monolithic one since once we're in a satisfactory orbit around Joule, we'll be unpacking it and reassembling it into our desired configuration. This is following a similar design from the last space station I built in one launch, which is only in polar Kerbin orbit, so it wasn't quite as big in terms of scope, but it was essentially the same thing where it was flat packed and reassembled in orbit. So luckily for me I didn't need to plan a transfer window for Joule as we were already roughly in the right spot to get an encounter with it straight away. Uh, obviously it's not the greatest encounter ever but we have enough fuel in our transfer stage to account for that. Joule is by far the easiest planet to get an encounter with because although it's extremely far away from Kerbin when compared to even Juna it has a colossal gravity well meaning that its sphere of influence is enormous and we can very easily get an encounter with it. Uh, the only downside really is that it requires a lot of fuel expenditure to to get there and in order to take advantage of the Oberth effect we want to spend as much time burning at Kerbin Periapsis as possible. Uh, you can google Oberth effect if you want to know more about how it works, I'm not going to go too much into detail here. So we're going to perform three burns, although as you can see I didn't actually execute the second burn very well and we spend most of our time actually burning before we even reach Periapsis, but whatever, you know, haters, haters gonna hate and I'm gonna do stupid things sometimes, so there you go. Uh, just bear in mind, try and start burning once the time to manoeuvre node indicator displays roughly half the estimated burn time for the most efficient burn possible. So, as an example, if your burn is two minutes, you want to start burning one minute before you get there. I've not been going too much into depth regarding the actual flight itself so far, as this ship is really designed for those of you who are confident in your abilities to get into LKO, and to plan transfer windows to different planets. What I would like to discuss in this video though is the series of gravity assists we'll be using to capture ourselves at Joule without needing to expend much fuel uh, or needing to rely on any silly and unrealistic error breaking, for this station is filled with fragile equipment and experiments, and so we can't just go about flying at a Joule or late atmosphere at high speeds, uh, but all this comes later in the video. Anyway, onwards to Jewel. So some of you may be wondering, Matt, you valiant and virtuous vacuum traversing veteran, how do I actually go about planning and executing gravity assists? And the answer, my friends, is... I don't know, I should make it up as I go along, really. But I can explain the basics. You see, there are two things you can do when it comes to exploiting the gravity of a planet or a moon. There are gravity boosts, which are just your standard gravity assists, and then there's gravity breaks as well, which are kind of considered reverse gravity assists. In the case of this mission, we want to use a gravity break as we're going to be slowing ourselves down to capture around Joule. For Joule captures, you can enter a stable orbit by using either the gravity from Tylo or Lathe. Ideally, we'd use Tylo, but sometimes you might find it easier to get an encounter with Lathe. I mean, either way, it doesn't matter a huge amount as the end result we pretty much the same for either moon especially for this mission we're doing here so to execute a gravity break simply set up a flyby with your periapsis in front of the moon's trajectory and if you wanted to do a gravity boost you would place your periapsis behind the body's trajectory and that's it that's where gravity assist tutorials begin and end 
Uh, you want to make sure that your Tylo or Lathe flyby also occurs before you reach your ultimate dual periapsis though, and you want to make sure that your post assist dual periapsis is still above its atmosphere. It's very tempting to get a really, really efficient and good gravity break from one of the moons, then you end up realizing that now your periapsis is way too low and you're going to just smash into dual. So, some of you now might be wondering at this point, Matt, you erroneous exploitative swindler, this is just blatantly exploiting KSP's basic physics engine and is not a realistic way of executing missions. And you're partially correct, this is definitely exploiting physics, but this actually works exactly the same in real life too. And it's not just a quirk of KSP's coding, gravity assists are very commonly used by real world space programs too, to save huge amounts of energy and fuel for interplanetary missions. It's a difficult concept to grasp, because at face value it just seems like we're gaining free energy from nothing, which is against the laws of physics. But we're not. As you approach a celestial body, we and it become tethered by gravity, such that we get pulled slightly towards it, and it get pulled slightly towards us. Given the mind-bogglingly, incomprehensibly vast difference between the size of the celestial body and the spacecraft, the effect on the planet or moon is completely insignificant, and it's not even regarded, even in the real world. Uh, whereas the spacecraft can gain a relatively enormous amount of kinetic energy. Uh, and get huge boosts. I mean, you look at the Voyager probes that were uh, sent out in the real world, they got all their trajectory pretty much from doing gravity assists from, from planets around the solar system. As for planning such assists around Joule, to be honest, I just set Lathe or Tylo as a target and just create manoeuvre nodes and play around with them until I get an encounter that gives us a satisfactory level of deceleration. In this instance, I managed to get both a Lathe and Tylo encounter in one burn, but if you don't do that, then it doesn't really matter at all. It just means that your overall mission will end up being fractionally longer. But like I say, just set one of them as a target and play around with the manoeuvre node. Maybe even use the skip to next orbit button if necessary. Do what you can, but you shouldn't be intimidated by gravity assists. They're way less uh, scary than they seem at face value. So I went with an orbital height between Lathe and Tylo, just a smidge higher than Val. This is because of all the moons our lander is designed for, Val is by far the most challenging to land on. But being this close to it means we can get there and circularize around it with very, very minimal amounts of fuel. Just to be careful though, do make sure that you are well clear of Tylo and I guess Val's sphere of influence too. Uh, you can check your safe by setting either of them as your target and making sure you're never going to get an encounter with them without adjusting your orbital trajectory I guess. So there we are. Now when it came to dumping the nuclear stage, I first off returned some of the fuel borrowed from the lander and then set up with both a Val assist and a lathe collision. I didn't want to just leave it stuck in orbit and I thought this would be a fairly cool way of disposing it. The eagle-eyed among you may even have noticed a small probe within Lathe's ocean, and that's the robotic submarine that I deployed there when I made my seaplane to Lathe video, which I highly recommend for those who haven't seen it. Sadly, it's not able to transmit data to Kerbin as its antenna is not powerful enough, but now we have this station here, we can start using it again. Of course, since it has no means of moving to another biome and it's not got any sort of engines on it, there's not a lot we can actually use it for, but we can use the power of our imaginations. <laughs> if you want to be cheesy, that is. So the station itself is primarily form over function in terms of its design. Right now in KSP, there are very few reasons you'll ever need to build a space station beyond just having something to look cool and have something to visit. Obviously, there are mods that add not only other station parts, but also add a bit of function to them by having sort of station related contracts. But this, and indeed all my other videos, is stock, so we won't be having to worry about any of that. Uh, so with that in mind, I've tried to make this thing look at the uh, business <laughs> and uh, kitted it out with uh, three science labs, many crew modules and command pods, and we'll just pretend that some of them are the gym, sleeping quarters, storage chambers, etc, etc. Uh, one neat thing on the station though is that there's a small lander docked to one of the labs that has enough fuel to land on and return from Val, Pol and Bob, and it's kitted out with all the science gear and mining equipment so it can refuel itself and bring back data to the main station, and then once it's at the lab, Labs in the station, the experiment bays on the lander can be reset and it can be sent out again to a different biome or a different moon to collect further experiments. So I guess in a way this station does have a little, like does serve a bit of purpose. Obviously practically if you wanted to do this for your science mode you probably wouldn't need a massive station. In fact you could easily incorporate the science lab into just one giant lander with a mining rig and do it much more efficiently there. But yeah, whatever. This lander even actually has the ability to do hops to Elu as well. Unfortunately, it can't really do Lathe or Tylo, but in the future I might expand the station to accommodate a Lathe lander, most likely some form of SSTO, and maybe even a Tylo lander as well. But since I wanted this to be a single launch station and I wanted people to be able to fly it with reasonably 
e reasonable ease, uh, I wanted to keep the initial construction fairly restrained. So here we are assembling the station. It's not terribly interesting to watch and it's not especially difficult to do yourself. So most of this part of the mission has been trimmed down so that the video doesn't run on sort of too long. Uh, for those unaware though, the controls for RCS thrusters are H and N for forwards and backwards and I, J, K and L for rotation. Uh, or you could use WASD if you wanted to use in the docking mode, but I've always preferred I, J, K and L. I don't know why. Uh, but yeah, the station now looks pretty much done, but we do still have those very ugly surplus monopropellant tanks covering the entire structure. I chose to make all the standalone monopropellant tanks and RCS thrusters, save for the ones on the lander, uh, detachable just to improve the aesthetics of the completed station. Now before you start commenting about Kessler Syndrome, worry not! Every detachable tank has a command module, SAS unit and a battery in order to deorbit itself and be destroyed in Jules' atmosphere. You'll need to do them one at a time though because they have no means of recharging their batteries once their electric supply has drained and so by doing them individually it means they'll remain charged until they're attached because they can use the solar panels and thermoelectric generators on the station. It is a rather time consuming process so what I did after I detached one of the probes was point it retrograde with the automatic SAS, you know the buttons to the left of the nav ball, and then just balanced a weight on the H key of the keyboard and then just played me some sweet ultimate Spider-Man on the adjacent monitor on my trusted GameCube. Uh, this method will only work if you're playing Ultimate Spider-Man though, uh, any other game, uh, it rustles the Kraken and your space station will somehow become broken. Uh, it's very weird, I know, but I think it's just one of those weird quirks of KSP's physics engine. Uh, so we'll just move on from that. An alternate method to deorbiting the tanks manually is just to terminate them in the tracking station, but I am aware that many of you, myself included for that matter, uh, like playing the game somewhat realistically, hence why this mission has left absolutely zero debris in space. Uh, without needing to rely on termination. This entire craft, including the launch vehicle, can be found in the description of the video, along with links to my Twitter and loot crates and stuff. I will likely make a continuation of this video at some point where we can test out our moon lander and grab some science from Val, Paul and Bop, and maybe other places too. In fact, I might even send a second mission to extend the station to accommodate refueling tanks maybe, or a lathe seaplane, or space plane. I, I don't know, but I, I, guess, I guess this all kind of depends on how popular this video turns out to be, but I mean, dual stations have been requested for a while. I uploaded my loot crate video today and literally one of the first comments was someone asking me if I could make a dual station. That was Meepster. So, yes, I can and I will. And I just did. But yes, that about wraps this video up. As mentioned earlier, there will be a link on screen in the top left to take you to the abridged music video version of this video. And you know what? I'm actually really pleased about how that one turned out. Uh, leave, leave any and all suggestions down below as well. Check my Twitter. I think I said that already. If you want, that's in the description. Uh, I, offer, I often upload preview screenshots or shots from failed missions on there for your enjoyment. Um, so there's that. And now I must leave you. Uh, I've actually been summoned for jury duty, actually. I've never had that before. It's really exciting. The uh, defendant is the Energizer Bunny. He's been charged with battery.